Champions for Children Tampa Bay offers a variety of innovative programs to prevent child abuse. It goes above and beyond so many others that I'm aware of. What I love about it is its client-centered approach. It is the clients who help to identify what, what direction and what programs they're going to have. Their holiday store actually empowers the parents in gift giving to their children and not Santa Claus. I want you to watch this because I really do want you to start the same holiday store in your hometown. Bon appetit. I'm a kind of an indiscriminate eater except for okra and oysters. There are a few things that are just wasted on me. Sushi kind of falls in that category. But good homemade bread, dense bread, bakery, uh, would even be better if you don't have a good baker in the house, uh, and a really good meatloaf. Champions for Children is a not-for-profit agency that is committed to the issue of uh, ending child abuse and neglect. And we do that through child abuse prevention uh, activities and family strengthening uh, parent education activities. We've been around for 37 years and up until about three years ago we were known as the Child Abuse Council. So the name Champions for Children reflects a um, a redefinition of who we see ourselves as being and who we want the community to um, think of us as. And about 15 years ago, um, a couple of things came together at the same time, I would say. It was kind of a serendipity, uh, but that might have been more intentional than I realized. Um, there was, um, across the national scene, there was much better uh, uh, research about uh, prenatal uh, development of, of uh, um, uh, fetuses at the, up to the point of, of the birth of, a, of an infant, uh, including brain development, and then in early, particularly in the early childhood years of uh, birth to age three, uh, much better research about brain development across all the different domains of speech and language and hearing and gross motor movement, even, but even a little social development and emotional development. Uh, so there was a legitimizing of the science of child development. So the research told us that, uh, that not only was child development going to play out on, on pretty predictable trajectories uh, month by month by month, but even more uh, uh, compelling uh, statements like uh, the fact that up to 85% of a baby's, uh, of a child's uh, uh, brain is hardwired by the time the child reaches his or her third birthday. Well, now that's a real, just grab you by the shoulder, shake you piece of information. Here was this great information that says there are these little clocks ticking inside children all up and down, but mostly, mostly in the brain. And by the way, the best way to cultivate all of that is in an interactive relationship with an other, with a parent, with a caretaker. So it was part the science and part the interactive bonding attachment nature of little kids and the caregivers. Well, so there's that. And then at this agency, there was this unique moment in time where a handful of agency stalwarts, board members, longtime supporters, and just visionaries who, who loved the mission of this agency said, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we had a kind of an any baby, any family welcoming center kind of program. And by the way, let's call that baby bungalow because there's a little building we want to host it in that happens to be a bungalow. So what seemed like overnight, looking back, was this decision that turned into action to create a service out of this agency that didn't discriminate against families who essentially were fine. They were just nervous or they were uninformed, it was first time parents, that kind of thing. And it transformed who we thought our clients were. Fast forwarding to now, to the, at the end of 2014, what you would see is that we have taken the concept of any baby, any family, and embedded it in the way that we design programs or solicited opportunities to expand or move in certain directions with uh, certain kinds of services. 
so that there is no family who is ineligible for what we do. And I would say that that's significant. So th th those were some, some things that came together. Brain research means it really matters to start early, uh, which by the way, the early years are the highest danger times from the child welfare perspective, so it was very resonant with our mission. But also, this is when you get it right for kids to ultimately enter kindergarten ready to learn. And the absence of children entering kindergarten ready to learn is now one of the biggest challenges of our country. That and then the baby bungalow concept to serve any baby, any family has redefined who our client population is. I'll give you, great, I'll give you three good examples right now. Um, and all of these trace back to that, that uh, combination of decisions that happened about 15 years ago. One is our baby bungalow program that I referred to uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. And I would say that in the beginning, all we knew was we wanted a place where any parent, uh, either expecting the birth of a child or who had an infant or a toddler or a preschooler, to be able to come and get information to get some social support, meet other families uh, like them. We wanted to invite people to come to a place. And we had our ideas about four or five or six different kinds of uh, uh, groups or classes, that kind of stuff we could, we could offer. I would say by the end of the first year of that experiment, we dropped two or three of those and responded to something else. And our biggest instructors were our parents who liked what we had to offer, helped define through a constant feedback loop with our staff, boy, this is great, no, I don't care much about that, boy, it sure is great to talk to that mom, which wasn't exactly where we thought our greatest hunger would be, uh, but it helped us do a couple of things. It helped us figure out that whatever we offered, uh, it needed to be no more than 50%, I'm completely making up this, this number right now, no more than 50% uh, uh, brainiac instruction on our part. Like, we're, we're the smart people who are going to teach you how to do the thing you need to do. And no more than 50% of the time is that. But the rest of it has to uh, allow for the interactive nature of families being with other families, kids being with kids, parents being with parents, caregivers being with caregivers, because that social interactive energy was so valuable to them. So ever since learning that lesson, no matter what we do, we always allow for that. We also knew that we wanted it to be inviting and fun and in no way uh, to identify families. Some families is in trouble, some families not as in trouble, we just happened to be wanting to learn a little bit. We, it was like the great leveler. Everybody was the same here. So we're much more conscious about making sure that there wasn't anything boneheaded that we might do by accident that made some people feel welcome and others feel not. Some people feel better than others. We wanted it all to be, let them work it out. Let's just support what happens here. Uh, the, the families also taught us that if we can get them started early, when they're the hungriest, and typically that was with the prenatal families or the families with infants, once they would complete a, a developmental play group with a certain group of other infants and other moms or dads, that when that was done, they were hungry for the next thing because the, of course, the, the, the reality was the kids kept growing. The parents needed to keep learning. And we, had, we hadn't thought of it that way. It was the, the developmental track was, of course, our big brainiac driving force. But it also happened to be exactly the best guideline for what the parents were going to tell us they needed. So we developed programming based on the developmental progression of children and parents, uh, some of whom stayed together in our services over years and kind of grew up with each other and brought their next kids back. So the, the families taught us what they needed. Well, that was a obviously common sense, but it was very humbling when you think your job is to know it all. So it was a real eye-opener that your client is going to tell you what, what she wants, and then you respond to that. So I, uh, I'm quite aware that I sound like a jackass saying this. <laughs> but, it, but, it, yeah, but it was, uh, you know, it's kind of, oh, I get it. I get it. She's the expert. She'll tell me what I need to find out to teach her so she can do her job as a mom. So Baby Bungalow really became a kind of a petri dish, in my opinion. So for our agency to literally listen to our consumers as the designers of our services and us to remain committed to the science behind it and create a model and embed science in a family-friendly uh, 
uh, setting and then grow with the parents and mobilize those services all over the county. I would say it's pretty magical. It's sort of smart business uh, and uh, it's kind of magical all at the same time. All of that is this movement in a wellness-based uh, y'all come, anybody's eligible kind of direction, borrowing from the rapidly developing brain stuff of the kids and the hungry for information and support needs of the parents. We got a really good quality uh, parent education service for fathers. Now this is a, this is a classic example of taking, uh, making a decision to go to an underserved population, fathers, but very much in the spirit of the old agency fathers who are in trouble. And we developed some really hardcore, uh, very rich long-term parent education for fathers who needed to demonstrate to a judge that they were safe to return the children to. Very much the way the old, old agency, but, but adopting fathers as our target. While we were doing that, we uh, found out about this national program called Boot Camp for New Dads. And what it was is a, a half-day, one-time session for first-time expectant fathers. And so we, we uh, got that launched in partnership with the local birthing hospitals uh, and saw a real difference between those two populations. More likely to be middle-class dads coming because their wives said, you're going, uh, as opposed to the fathers who a judge says, you're going. Over time, we kept thinking that those dads from the boot camp class once the babies were born, would join their wives and their girlfriends and start coming to our baby bungalow classes, which were already in place. Start signing up for our home visitation parents as teachers. We thought, we, we got this all set. We're just adding this little element where dads get their own little dads only class, where graduates bring their babies back and team teach the boot camp class with babies in the room so dads don't hold a doll in the class, they hold a squirming little baby. We thought they'd just sign up. Well, they didn't. I think we stumbled into a gender studies issue here where, and we even did a little research back about 10 or 12 years ago when we uh, talked to moms in a focus group in Baby Bungalow and said, what do you think about the idea of intentionally incorporating dads into the Baby Bungalow classes? And the moms as a whole said, we think that's a great idea. At the same time, we talked to the dads in the boot camp class and said, what do you think about uh, dads uh, coming to, joining their, their girlfriends and wives and fiancés in, uh, in the baby bungalow classes versus having some dads only stuff? And they said, no, we want our own. So we had dads tell us in their own polite but pretty candid ways, there's a kind of learning we're better, better able to do about this stuff called raising kids that we feel like we're completely ignorant about when it's dads only as opposed to women in the room who we happen to see as knowing more than we do anyway. In this last year, we found another funding source to help help us borrow from the baby bungalow design of the, of the, the uh, development of playgroups, but attach it as an extension of our boot camp class for first time dads so that when the baby is born, those dads bring their babies and come back to dads and babies only developmental playgroups. And we've been doing this for about four or five months now. Three consecutive days leading up to the, the Christmas holidays themselves, we convert a little building that we happen to have. It's our bungalow where our baby bungalow program uh, operates out of. We convert it into what amounts to a toy store. And when it is fully fleshed out with all of these donations that we solicit or come at us uh, from all different directions that we, by the way, frame to people to say, this is what we need. This is what we don't need. We don't need big toys so that we got two big toys and a million little toys and two kids are going to score big and everybody else gets something less. And we also don't need toys of violence. It'll really guide what people would give us with an emphasis on uh, something that would um, nurture child development. Meanwhile, we've got all of our staff working with all of their clients and consumers to um, identify um, uh, down to the individual family, how many children they have, what the ages of the children uh, are, what their sex is, that kind of information. And then we work with our staff to schedule shopping appointments for the families so that on each of these three days when the holiday store is in operation, we've got uh, uh, families from different programs all over our agency uh, arriving here for their scheduled shopping appointment 
uh, where we've already got a registration table, we're expecting them, we've got a volunteer personal shopper to assign to the parent, we've got information that says um, Mrs. X has got um, uh, three children, a six-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy and an infant uh, girl. So, and by that time we know uh, how to treat equitably all children, so depending upon what we uh, accumulate, every child gets one large toy and two medium-sized toys and a stocking stuffer. So the parents, are they're doing the shopping for their children. The Angel Tree is a tree that we put in our lobby and we get it up uh, the week before Thanksgiving so we give the employees a good amount of time to donate and we reach out to two organizations, one of which is the Champions for Children, and we put tags on this tree and each tag has a specific item that we ask employees to donate and they vary from arts and crafts, educational toys, sports, watches, dolls. One year we were looking to uh, reach out to organizations that um, had a, a large impact into our community and um, I was introduced to them by a colleague here at Cineverse. So we reached out to Champions for Children and um, I think we are on year 10 now that we have been supporting them. My interest is the fact that uh, who we are today as adults um, is largely impacted by what we were surrounded with as children. And I think that Champions for Children sees that understands that and knows that it's not just important for counseling for children, but it's also important to counsel parents because that's who these children are going to be with. So they look at it as a whole and they provide the counseling for both the children and the parents. So at this time, we have been supporting the holiday store at Champions for Children and basically what they do is they ask different organizations, uh, different companies to provide certain items. They give us those items. Um, they exclude uh, any items that are guns, anything violent. So that's another thing that we thought was very interesting. And um, we then collect these toys and deliver them to Champions for Children. What they do is then they take these items and they separate them into age-appropriate aisles, so to speak, and parents get to come in that are part of this program and they shop free of charge for these items. And why that's so important to us is because we know that who better to know a child than their parents? So they get that opportunity to go pick their gift and it's even wrapped for them. So when they go home, all they have to do is put it under their Christmas tree. I think this benefits the parents because as we see this time of the year, there's a lot of, of feeling that you can't do anything. And especially for these parents that have been through a lot, as well as these children, um, the holiday store provides that opportunity for a parent to feel empowered. We have estimated that uh, on a yearly basis, we give between four to $8,000 in toys. So what we do is we have a set amount that the Cineverse Employee Association uh, allows me to have. And what we do is we go out and purchase the items that we generally see are not the ones that we receive. For example, uh, they may be higher in price, some leapfrogs. And uh, so we purchase those and then we take the other items that are brought in from the employees and then they get delivered to Champions for Children. We have just a few over a hundred employees at this agency. About 20% uh, uh, of those are part-timers and the rest are, are full-timers, but a little over a hundred. The size of our budget is a little bit over five million dollars. It's about 5.3 million dollars. And I can tell you that almost exactly 800,000 
dollars of that 5.3 million we have to raise privately. Special events, major gifts, uh, checks in the mail, um, uh, wills and bequests, uh, uh, some grant writing, uh, foundation support, that kind of thing. So it's a, for me that's a sizable um, private fundraising goal. Where our money comes from is, uh, well, that is not privately raised, the rest of it is uh, primarily uh, governmental sources or quasi-governmental sources. So we have relationships uh, with uh, our local Children's Services Council that derives its cash flow from uh, ad valorem taxes in the local community. Uh, we have a funding relationship with our Healthy Start Coalition, which is part of a statewide system organized around uh, maternal child health and early childhood. Uh, then we have some targeted relationships with um, our Early Learning Coalition of Hillsborough County that um, is focused on early, um, uh, early learning settings and child care centers as well as uh, uh, some, some foundations that are, are particularly interested in the work that we do. The majority of our funding comes from these governmental and quasi-governmental services. To the, so now that we are looking at, so what are some of the funding relationships that we simply haven't taken seriously before, we haven't explored? So we're in active conversations with the Head Start programs here in the county. Uh, we've recently gotten a, a contract with um, uh, our city government to help us support some of our neighborhood work because it happens to be targeted neighborhood for them. So some traditional funding sources and for us some non-traditional because some of our programming has adapted over the time.